Hello, I'm Sarah. This is Hardcover Hearts. And I'm back from a brief hiatus, an intentional hiatus, I have to say. Um, I did go to London uh, on business and came back and just got completely overwhelmed in work. Uh, even though I was reading, I just did not have an opportunity to sit down, film a video, edit it, and get it up. So thank you for all of you who have been patient waiting for me to come back. So I have been reading a lot of books. I, I went through and I pulled out some that I really want to talk about. So that's what I'm going to share today and then kind of ease back in with what I'm currently reading. So to catch you up, uh, here is a book that I read and I read, finished this on the plane going to London. Uh, and when they say that this book is uh, written by Britain's Patricia Highsmith, they're not kidding. This was a creepy, delicious, fun, dark, twisted little book. Uh, and I usually don't go for creepy, but this one worked for me. This is Uncle Paul by Celia Fremen. And just this fantastic, fantastic cover. I just, I love this series. This is done by Faber and Faber. Uh, they have a, along the bottom, it says, welcome to the nightmare summer holiday. Woo! Um, this was fantastic. So in this book, we have three sisters. Uh, we're introduced to Meg. Meg is living in London. Uh, she has one sister, Isabel. Isabel is married with two children, two young children, a uh, husband uh, who seems a little uptight, uh, seems a little difficult. And he is her second husband. And then we also have her other sister, Mildred. Mildred is her half sister and she's significantly older. Now, Mildred seems super high strung, like kind of diva-esque behavior, um, demanding, uh, a little paranoid. Uh, so it's very clear that Meg tries to keep boundaries and keep her distance from Mildred. Well, she gets a call uh, that from from her from her sister Isabel that Mildred is uh, freaking out, um, having a lot of anxiety, and is going to go to a cottage that they that they used to all um, holiday in near the beach. And so Isabel, it, it, with her two young kids, are going to go and they're going to stay in their caravan uh, at the same seaside. Um, spot and they'll camp there just to kind of be there to support Mildred and but Isabel really wants Meg to come to help because uh, I guess it's a two-person job to help Mil call Mildred down. Meg really doesn't want to go she has this new boyfriend and things are going really well and but she's not really sure he kind of keeps her on the back foot and she's uh, it's a still very very new relationship. But she agrees to go. She's only going to go for the weekend. She's just going to go for the weekend and see what's going on. She gets there and M Mildred has worked herself into a, a tizzy, into a fervor. And it actually sounds like it's a good reason. Mildred had uh, has an ex-husband who was arrested for uh, the murder of his first wife. And we find out that his arrest had something to do with this family. Uh, one of them uh, did something that led to the arrest and he has been released. Uh, he is, and so they're anticipating that he's gonna come back and he's going to seek revenge. At least that's what Mildred thinks. And so this entire time, at the beach, we have all of these women acting, um, looking over the shoulder. Everything seems suspicious, even the men in their lives. Uh, and I think that cr created such a delicious, a very exciting, enthralling read because no one was above suspicion in this book. It's tense, there's so much distrust. It almost felt like there was. I don't know, this this uh, feminist bent to it as if, you know, no man could be trusted because of all of the suspicious things that they do in ways that they uh, are diminishing or demeaning or acting un 
basically uncool to, to the women in their lives. It was delicious, fantastically fun. And while I was in the UK, I bought two other ones from, from this author. This was, this was a delightful, titillating, exciting read, I have to say. The next book I, uh, I did, I did this in audio and I kept hearing about this. This is not something that I found in the United States or talked about too often in the United States, but I guess this is a big deal in the UK. And this is Prima Face. I think that's how you pronounce it. And it's by Susie Miller. Now this was a, uh, I think it's a one woman play that has been turned into a book. Uh, this was exceptional. And I have to say it was actually fantastic to be listening to it as I'm riding through London, especially as I was passing by the Old Bailey. It just felt like the perfect book at the perfect time. Uh, this is a story about a defense barrister who believes very, very strongly in um, the principles of law, believes very strongly that people deserve uh, uh, fair representation uh, because of things that she has seen cops do and police and, and prosecutors do in her past. Uh, she has a very non-traditional past. She grew up uh, poor, underprivileged, but was incredibly resourceful, incredibly intelligent, and uh, made her way to uh, becoming a, a barrister for def a defense barrister. I think is what they call them, like defense lawyer. And she's often pulled in and often someone who is sought after for sex cases. So where she is defending a rapist or someone who's been accused of rape. And, and this is something that she has found a way to parse out in her mind of what her purpose is and what she's trying to do, irrespective of what they've done, uh, what she has a very principled approach to law. Well, something happens to her and she ends up as a victim and is has really the, the, uh, the blindfold ripped off of her face and she starts to see the experience from the other side of the coin, the other side of the equation and recognizing how completely difficult it is for women uh, who have been attacked or hurt or victimized uh, to get justice. Uh, so it's so much about a interrogation of, cla of the class system and the justice system in the UK. And so much of it could be applied to the United States as well, but it is specifically set within that context. And she's such a great character. It, the audio was sublime. It was so good. I'll, I forget the narrator's name off the top of my head, but I'll include it in the notes below. It was uh, intense. It was, it was, um, it was jarring. I mean, trigger warnings abound for uh, assault and for those types of things, because it's, it's there. And I appreciated the detail. I appreciated the, all of the steps that she ha that she goes through uh, both as a barrister and also as um, as someone who has been victimized by by someone, I think it was a really thoughtful interrogation of the system, of the assumptions that people make in the system, of uh, what it means to try to be principled in what's probably a skewed uh, and faulty system of justice heart pounding. I mean, they, they were, they were intense, intense scenes, but I thought that it was incredibly, incredibly well done. Speaking of incredibly well done, uh, just got done having my in real life book club, uh, went to this fantastic Indian restaurant that, uh, we love so much ate outside because the day has been, uh, a little cloudy, a little chilly, but but every once in a while the sun would peek through and it was absolutely gorgeous. So we got a chance to get together to talk about this book with the most amazing cover. This cover would never be on a, on a United States book. Uh, it's because we don't put photographs of black men and women on our, on our 
books, uh, book covers. It's an, an atrocity, but this is just such an amazing cover. This is Fire Rush by Jacqueline Crooks. Look at that cover. And the back is pretty incredible as well. This was on the short list for the Women's Prize, which is why we were reading it. And I think it's also been nominated for the Jollock Prize this year. This book is incredible, y'all. Um, from the moment I opened it up, I was completely sucked in. There is a vibrancy and a pulse to this book that starts immediately. We have a young woman, Yame, and she is independent. She is uh, going out every night with her two girlfriends to these, these reggae uh, dub ska clubs, dark uh, kind of underground scene, uh, dancing all night long, um, living her best life but completely free. This feels like it's in the 80s uh, and it was something that my girlfriends and I looked at and we we're like, we were these characters. Uh, we were all involved in the punk scene in the 80s. And there was a lot of her interest in, in, in being in dangerous situations because the, that's where the music was. That's where her people, that's where she felt alive. And we all, we all recognize that feeling tremendously. She is, she goes out with her friends. She goes to these clubs. Uh, she sees a man that she, that she dances with and she, there's a chemistry, there's something there. Uh, uh, he offers her and her girlfriends a ride home, but on the ride home, her girlfriend, very competitive, kind of uh, nuzzles in and all of a sudden he becomes fo focused on her and she is beautiful and she is charming and she is po like powerful and knows it. Uh, and so Yame is kind of sits back and watches and wants to see what happens. Uh, she knows that it could, it could go either way. Uh, we fast forward more dances, more nights out. And uh, this gentleman, they call him Moose. Uh, he it very clearly indicates that he is interested in her and they start a relationship. And it's really the first time in her life that she feels like there's someone out there who could really care about her. Uh, she, her mother has left the family many years ago. Her father is distant, remote, even though he's right there. Uh, they don't have a relationship to speak of. Uh, she has jobs, but it's not really anything. Uh, she's not really anchored or tethered. She has her girlfriends, but it's not, it's not um, always easy. But here's someone who really sees her and really is there for her. It's not really a spoiler because it is in all of the promotional materials. It does talk about how their relationship is, is cut very abruptly short and it really sends her reeling and she gets caught up in things that uh, if she had, if she was in a different state of mind, she never would have gotten involved with. This is a young woman who is smart, is uh, very self-aware and she knows that ultimately she only has herself to, to look out for. She, she's the only person she can count on. And she has to find her inner strength to find a way out of the precarious situations that she's gotten herself involved in. Uh, that, that, I don't wanna to give too much away, but there's so much more at play here. Uh, the writing is atmospheric. It's, um, it, there's a beat to it. There's a percussiveness to it. There is, you feel the culture, you feel the music, you feel um, the freedom that she thinks she has. You also feel the heartbreak. You feel the injustice. Uh, the way this book deals with very difficult things, honestly and realistically, was, was wonderful. Uh, didn't make for a comfortable read. It doesn't make for a tidy read, but it makes for a read that feels earned. Uh, you feel like, like this author knows of what she speaks. Uh, yeah, incredible book. We all, uh, we all loved it. And, and we're wondering, are there other books about 
this uh, subculture, the the uh, really it's the second generation from the Windrush um, era, the and and the ska movement and the Northern Soul movement. If you know any other fictional books that that have this milieu, uh, we would love to know. We would love to know. So yeah, fantastic. So glad. I never would have read this book, never would have come across my radar were it not for the Women's Prize or the Jollock Prize. So it helps to read those prizes. Then the last book I want to talk about is The Seventh in a series that I'm reading with my dear friend Leo from Leo's Little Book Life. And this is Emile Zola's The Assommoir. Uh, this is translated by Brian Nelson. This is my fantastic Oxford University Press edition. This was written in 1877, though it is so modern, it is so contemporary, uh, you wouldn't, you, you quickly forget it. You quickly forget that. Uh, and this is recognized as, as so important a book that uh, my French teacher said that it's read outside the, the 20 volume Rougon Macar series. So it's read as a standalone because it speaks so passionately, compassionately, about poverty in Paris and the lower classes and how difficult life was and almost impossible sometimes to rise above. In this book, we have Gervais and we meet Gervais as a young woman with two, two boys and she has fallen in love with this man and he is the father of her, her two children. They are not married, but they have moved to Paris together. And Gervais is hardworking. She is a laundress and she, she throws everything that she can into her family, into her work. And she has very, very high standards. And I wish she had such high standards for the men that she chooses because uh, they're all rotten. Starting with the first man who leaves her uh, and, and she is uh, left on her own. But she picks up the pieces, she puts her, puts her back into it and uh, sets off to make do with what she, the cards she was dealt and she proceeds to establish herself as one of the best laundresses in uh, working in, in this Paris neighborhood. She is started to be courted by this man. He's a roofer and seems like a good man, like a very good man, but you know, she's, very wary. And she says, you know, you don't want to get involved with me. I don't think this is a good idea. Keeps trying to push him off, push him off. He wins her over eventually. And they start a, a love affair. And at first it's fantastic. They move out of their small uh, little one bedroom uh, kind of uh, hotel room and they move to a little apartment. And she saves and she saves and she saves. And she has a dream of opening her own laundry service, her own uh, laundrette. And she has a dream and she's picked out the exact spot and she's saving and she's saving. And her husband has a fall from the roof and hurts himself very badly. And he is never really the same after that. And, and she proceeds to uh, take over and and help him and and enable him to continue to be less than he should be, uh, and he falls in the hands of drink. Uh, she does a she is able to secure a loan from a man who thinks very very highly of her and is actually kind of in love with her. He's a neighbor and he loans them the money for so she can open this business they end up moving so that they can be closer to the business and they move into, it's really like, it feels like a tenement building and the her business will be at the bottom floor at the at street level. Uh, so they move in, his family lives in, his um, sister lives in this building and, but there it's, it's completely a hellscape of poverty and suffering and, uh, people just making do and doing whatever they can to avoid being thrown out on the streets and avoid starving. Uh, very dark, very damp, uh, very hot in the summer, of course, freezing in the winter. And just so many stairs, so many levels to this building. Well, they, for a very, very long time, are doing inc incredibly well. 
but he keep her husband keeps slipping away. He keeps going away, he keeps sneaking away and not going to a job. And she makes excuses and excuses and excuses until uh, slowly her standards start to slip and everything else just kind of slides from there. It is a slow, painful descent into what we know is going to happen, uh, into alcoholism, into destitution and poverty. Uh, it's a true tragedy. <laughs> I'm not, there is, there's no, um, no good story here for, for the characters, but the writing, the writing is just exquisite. Um, as with every Zola book I've read so far, there are scenes like as I'm talking to you, I'm seeing them in my head. They're that vivid. They're that pronounced. This is an absolute masterpiece. Uh, I, I understand why. Uh, and as I loved and hated reading it because Gervais is just, you just want better for her, uh, better than she can see. And you just know it's not, it's not gonna end well. Um, yeah, on to, on to the eighth in the Rougon Maca series. So with that, let me talk a little bit about what I'm currently reading. Uh, let's start with that. Uh, you could just tell that Zola himself was also, uh, like, okay, let's, let's get a little ray of sunshine in here. So the next one is called A Love Story, and this is number eight. Now, this is actually, uh, translated by Helen Constantine. Um, and so far this is, so much more, so much more um, optimistic and joyous. It's, tr it's a true love story. The love of a daughter for her mother, uh, the interest of a woman for a man who's married and his interest in her, uh, kind of a meeting of the minds, and also a love note to Paris. So it's off to an amazing start. So excited to continue this. And then keeping with the Paris theme, uh, I, when I was in London, I got the first of this series. This is the third, so I've kind of skipped the second. I don't know how I did that, but uh, this is uh, the late Monsieur Gallet, and this is George Simenon's Inspector McRae series. Uh, it's so good so far. Just, you know, my, this these go so fast. They're, they're such fast reads. Uh, I'm really enjoying it. It's set a little bit outside Paris, so it doesn't have the same kind of excitement that the first one did. Um, and that was Peter the Latvian. But so far, this is very good. Then I, <laughs> for someone who didn't read any short stories, I'm reading two short story collections right now. I don't, I, who am I? Uh, the first one is because I'm planning a trip to um, Amsterdam, Dublin, and London this summer. So I wanted to read something of from Ireland, specifically Dublin. And you really can't go wrong with James Joyce's The Dubliners. And so Dubliners is here. This is a really beautiful edition that I found. And uh, these are short stories that he wrote. Now, some of these are a little confusing because there's a lot of, of, of religion and I don't really know a lot about Christianity to be perfectly frank. Uh, so, but you know, his writing is, is exquisite. So I'm enjoying these so far. But the absolute revelation uh, is, is this book. This is A Manual for Cleaning Women by Lucia Berlin. I found this in an Oxfam store in London. And I can't even tell you how deeply in love I am with these short stories. Every single one of them has been outstanding. Uh, a slice of life, a little glimpse into other people's existence not weird, not like some kind of weird gut punch at the end that you're left not knowing what's going on, not surreal, uh, really true, feels authentic, interesting uh, perspectives. And it says here in the back that I think is, is perfect. Uh, drawing on her own rich itinerant life, Berlin invites the reader into a world of beauty, pain, laughter, drink, and surprising moments of grace. In Mexico, Chile, and the American Southwest, in laundromats, hospitals, motels, and bars, she crafts miracles from the everyday. And that's what I love. So really enjoying this incredibly. And then the last thing is I'm listening to a book that's on the Women's Prize nonfiction long list. Uh, this is the first time they're doing something like that. And it's called Thunderclap 
A Memoir of Art and Life and Sudden Death. And this is by Laura Cumming. And it's about the, it's about a, a lot of things. Um, so it's one of those memoir, someone's reflecting about their life as they're talking about something else. Um, and so there's like these interconnections between her life and uh, something that she fell in love with, which was the all of the insight and information about an artist that she personally and her father personally loved, which was uh, Carl Fabricius, who did The Goldfinch. I think if you may be familiar with the Donna Tart cover of her book, The Goldfinch, it's that painting. And uh, he was killed in a a uh, random spontaneous explosion that happened in 1654 in Delft. And she talks about him and his life and she reflects on her father who was also an artist and his introduction uh, to her about art. And then, and, and these, it's not a, it's not a mapping. It's not like this person reminds me of my father. It's, it's much more intricate than that. I can tell already it's going to be one of those books that I'm probably going to want to have my hands on, but the author reads it herself. And so that's a uh, uh, very compelling. So I'm sure I'll be able to review this uh, next week when I talk to you then. So that's it for now. I would love to know, have you read any of these and what were your thoughts? And if you have any recommendations of fiction um, set in that kind of London uh, of the reggae scene. Uh, would love to love to know that if you don't mind. And I'll look forward to talking to you next week. Thank you so much.